Now, Nigeria's finance minister, Kemi Adiyoshun, says government data shows people are under-declaring their taxes on a massive scale, with only 226 people accounting for 20 billion naira in an economy with 65 million economic, economically active people. As the deadline of the Voluntary Assets and Income Declaration Scheme draws closer, CNBC Africa caught up with her at the Ogun State Investors Forum to discuss this and more. Incredible progress um, so far. Very, very encouraging signs. Uh, we knew that everybody would wait to the last minute, so it's as expected. I was just speaking to the chairman of Inland Revenue here in Ogun, and he said, look, I'm at 500 million already, and it's a, just a handful of people that have complied. So the, the signs are very encouraging. It, for us, it proves that um, the data, the analysis we did was correct, um, because we analysed the data and saw that people clearly are under-declaring on a massive scale. And so far, um, I think at federal level, just 226 people account for 20 billion. So if you begin to extrapolate and think about the thousands of forms that are in circulation, we expect that um, we'll um, bring many, many more people into the tax net correctly. It's not just about paying the arrears of taxes that they should have paid, but for us, it's more, what's more important is being taxed at the right level going forward. But I know that there's still so many people who wouldn't come forward and probably just want to see if there's a bite, you know, from the side of the yeah. fiscal authorities. So come March 31st, what's going to happen? Are you going to name and shame prosecutors? Well, yeah, I mean, what's got to happen is for personal taxes, many of the states are working on um, using sort of mobile courts and uh, so fast tracking so that cases don't get caught up in the long um, legal process because tax evasion is a very easy and straightforward prosecution. So a lot of states are starting to look at setting up, you know, special courts, quote unquote, that just deal specifically with tax evasion matters. And tax evasion is a crime. Uh, and of course, once people are then prosecuted, we feel that we should come out and say, this is the person that's being prosecuted for tax evasion, and this is why. Uh, so that it acts as a deterrent uh, to others. But I'm not sure that that's really um, where our focus is. Our focus really is on getting everybody to do the right thing because, you know, these monies were made in Nigeria. They're made from Nigeria. Uh, and it's only fair and right that some of that money is, is ploughed back into the system to allow all of us uh, to go forward. So what's going to happen after VAIDS? If we we continue are, the focus on, on tax collection. Um, we're going to focus on VAT. Uh, we're going to focus on, uh, I mean, getting the number of taxpayers up is critical. Uh, the figures I recently got from FRS were, we're now at 17 million. That's a huge achievement, because I think when we came in, we were at 13. We're now at 17. But there are 65 million, Naira, 65 million people who are economically active. So there's still a long way to go. There's a lot of work still to be done in, on the tax system. So VAID is just one of many reforms. Um, the other reforms that we're working on are constant updates to our tax laws. Some of our tax laws are obsolete. We haven't updated them. We haven't um, come up to speed with different commercial realities. We haven't, for example, got a strategy for taxing e-commerce. Um, a lot of transactions are now happening online. How do we get them into our tax net? So there's constant work to be done on the tax Well, system. is that in the works already? Absolutely. We have a national tax policy that FEC approved. We have a national uh, a committee uh, that pulls together the academia, the private sector, the public sector, and the collecting agents, and they just constantly have their committee meetings, work, look at specific areas of the tax law, and, um, and recommend changes. So the first set are go hopefully going to FEC in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll go to the National Assembly. So it's a constant process of upgrading and updating and making sure that our tax um, laws are not only effective, mm -hmm. but also ease um, the convenience in terms of payment. Okay, let's talk about government debt. That's also something that's made headlines. We know what the federal government and fiscal authorities are doing, trying to scale back on domestic debt. Mm -hmm. There's a, that $2.5 billion euro bond to refinance a maturing a local, uh, local treasure bills to make more way, as it were, for the private sector. Bring us up to speed on that. And uh, there's a lot of talk about the sustainability of that and if it's going to have the desired impact that mm -hmm. you desire. Right. Well, I mean, the first thing to say about our whole debt strategy is it remains incredibly conservative. So in terms of debt to GDP ratio, we're at 21. Um, the upper limit for a developing economy is recommended at 40. Some of our neighbours, 
not too far from here as high as 60, some are at 80. So our debt to GDP is very low and we intend to stay in the low range. However, there is a desperate need for investment and that investment has got to be financed. Um, and that investment is long-term investment. So rail that will last for the next 50 years has to be financed. And the only way you can finance it is having long-term debt. Roads and needs um, to develop roads and need to develop power. These are long-term assets, so we've got to match them with long-term liabilities. Um, so our strategy as far as debt was concerned was to have more longer tenured debt which is why we, ref we refinanced Treasury bills, which were largely 91, 180 days, and moved out to 20, 30 years. So we're matching the lifespan of the asset with the, the liability. And as you pointed out correctly, um, by moving more to external debt, we're creating headroom for the private sector. We're also creating headroom for the monetary authorities, hopefully when the um, conditions allow to begin to bring down interest rates. So it's all part of a comprehensive okay. strategy. And I know that one sticking point for this administration and even for you as a finance minister is, I mean, when you look at a wage bill from month to month and the amount that you have to, you know, dish out as it were, mm. just to pay wages, overheads, and of course the kind of cash that's not left for real development, I mean, that's been very tough. Mm. So how are you dealing with that? How are you coping with that? And what is, I mean, is there light at the end of the tunnel for that? I mean, there's been talk about we, we cannot reduce maybe not the right time to reduce the, uh, of course, public service, that's a, an even more sticky point. But I mean, how are you coping? Yeah. Well, our strategy around that was two things. One was, as you know, we increased the size of the budget. And why we did that was to allow 30% minimum to go on capital. What was happening in the past was the wage bill was so large, and when revenue was squeezed, what government simply did was pay salaries, pay debt service, and whatever was left over went to capital. And that wasn't enough. So you had a situation, for example, where works only got 19 billion for roads in 2015 and that's that's nothing um, compare that to the 305 billion we did in 2016 you get a sense and even that is not enough so we've recognized the fact that we must continue to invest in capital we must continue to invest in infrastructure um, and because that's what will drive growth and we don't even have enough money in government and so we need to crowd in the uh, private sector which is what we're, we're doing with some of our new initiatives. Now with regards to the wage bill, our, our sense was that first of all we need to control it. We didn't have any controls. So we had a lot of people who were dead, people who were fraudulent that were sitting on the wage bill. We've used a lot of technology to clean the wage bill uh, and to compress it. So we're keeping it under control. Yes, um, it rises year to year because people get promoted and so on, but I think we have a lot more assurance that money isn't going missing on a monthly basis. And we've seen you know, shrinkages in individual payrolls as we've migrated people onto the IPPI system. So as far as leakages are concerned, you, would you say that you've significant, significantly blocked the leakages? Yeah, I think we've reduced them. I mean, they're always, you know, people always find new ways to do things. Um, we're still um, trying to resolve with the PENCOM and, and the PFAs over 36,000 uh, entries from the payroll who had pension accounts and we're saying okay since we now know these people didn't exist where is the money that was for their pay so those are constant um, uh, sort of areas of, of work and of concern around the recurrent bill but what I can assure you is that we've really tried to improve the level of assurance that anybody we're paying is valid exists is being paid at the right sum. There's still a lot of work to do. It's a continual process, but I'm, I'm very confident that we will um, get there. Now you mentioned the budget earlier. Speaking about that, I know that that's also a sticking point. I know that the executive, according to executive, you've done your own part, and it's you know, with the National Assembly. Now they want the MDA to also come and present their budgets so that, according to them, everything is a lot more tidy. But as that happens, or, that, or as that is happening, you know, we're, the clock is ticking, as it were, and we're trying to go back to that, you know, one year, January to December. How much more difficult does that make your jo your own job? And we talk about budget performance. 2017 didn't do so well. I'm thinking, really? are we repeating? Really? What, are we repeating? Is that what's going to happen for 2018? I, yes. I don't agree with you. It didn't do so well. Um, I don't. I don't. In terms I, of capital disbursements, 1.3 trillion. I don't, that's one of the highest levels ever. Don't agree. Well, com compared to okay, go, go ahead. Compared to 1.258 trillion the year before, I don't agree. And, and no, compared to I mean the infrastructure gap on ground and what we have to do. See, the infrastructure gap on ground will not just be filled by the budget alone. Yeah, definitely. You've they, they, you know our budget is seven trillion. It's a hundred trillion economy. 
right? So we need everybody. We need the private sector, we need the pension funds, we need all the stakeholders and all the actors aligned to solve the infrastructure deficit. I don't think it is realistic to expect government on its own to solve that problem in two years, especially as for 25 years we haven't really made concerted efforts to fix the infrastructure gap. Um, but in terms of the process, it is a process that the executive prepare a budget, submit it to the legislature. The legislature must do their work. I, I think it's just a process that we are going to have to get more and more comfortable with and work out the, um, you know, the, the sticky points as, as we go along. You mentioned the pension funds. I mean, I've spoken to a number of pension PFAs, and, it, and I still get that sense of uh, caution, extreme caution, actually, and a lot of them are quite nervous. Yes, they know, they say that the pension funds can help to a large extent, but we haven't really seen that come through, as it were. What is it that, what kind of partnership, what, what can be done to unlock those funds? Once we're and we're working with them, and um, we've had a number of meetings with them to understand what their challenges are what their limitations are, what their risk appetite is, and what it would take for them to invest more actively. Um, it's a partnership. We have a number of initiatives that we've started. The Road Trust Fund, uh, which is the tax credit relief scheme, we actually flexed it to ensure that pension funds could participate. I think what's got to happen is that we have to get comfortable with each other. The pension funds have to get comfortable outside of where they sit at the moment in terms of the risk profile, and government has to build that trust. It will take time, but the engagement is on, and we're very confident that um, um, a number of projects will soon be um, finalised, which will be funded partially from, from pension money. They need long-term infrastructure, and we need them. So it's just a question of ironing out some of the legal challenges, the regulatory challenges, and the risks. Uh, and that, that will take time, but once it's done, it will then be um, incremental progress there. So it's in the works. It's something Absolutely. that's already ongoing. It's something the economic management team have engaged with the whole uh, the PFAs, um, and then a team was put together, myself, the central bank governor, the DG of the DMO, to have further meetings with them and to be more granular around okay, which projects, what do you need, what, what, what assurances, what guarantees. So, so we, we, it, it's a process, you know, it's a very fundamental need and it has to be designed right because the pensions, this, the pension funds are just custodians. It's my money and your money and it's money for our old age. So we're not in a hurry to make a mistake. We're not in a hurry to get things wrong. We'd rather take our time and do it properly with the right safeguards for the pension Pension, uh, pensioners of the future, which is, you know, you and I. I mean, absolutely correct. Now, I want to take you back to what we talked about. I mean, the leakages and, of course, the corruption that still, uh, that still remains in the system. And the vice president was quoted a few days ago as saying that we haven't tackled uh, corruption effectively. I mean, it would appear that that's what, I mean, so many people have echoed that. So how, does that make your job even more difficult when you think about the fact that we're tackling corruption, but it just, it's just so difficult and it looks like, you know, we don't, we don't have that effect. You know, you, you've got to look at the history. How long have we lived with these type of systems? How long have we lived with these kind of practices? Uh, t the answer is too long. Uh, from my end, we are trying to block leakages and we believe prevention is better than cure. The one thing I think we've all learned in the last couple of years is that after money has gone, running after it to get it back can take years. So we on the financial end are working very much on prevention. And what does that mean? That means better accountability, better transparency, better systems and processes. There's a lot of work going on with the efficiency unit, uh, with PICA, the Presidential Initiative on Continuous Audit, even as we speak now, or they've just got back, the whistleblower unit just went on a study tour. The UK government invited them to come and see how they run whistleblowing. And the focus there has been more on prevention. How do we prevent? How do we look at a, a case where, say, money has gone missing and say, how did the person do it, rather than who did it? And that change in approach can cause us to tighten up controls. So that's a constant process that we're working on. Uh, a lot of our financial procedures are very old. They need to be updated. They're not robust, uh, but it's a process that will continue. And what we're going to do, or what we plan to now do, is work very hard on communication because the whistleblower unit may realize or may have worked out how somebody was able to defraud some. But if we don't share that information across the board so that um, chief executives can look out for certain signs, uh, give people training in anti-fraud procedures. It's a collective effort, um, but I, I think that it's, it's something that we're going to have to be very patient, but we have to be very dogged and consistent with.
Kemi Adioshu, Nigeria's finance minister.